apart from excellent image quality, I find good enough for reproduction in books, magazines and on calendars. I also like the smaller cameras, also the image stabilisation it offers, which I can hand hold quite comfortably when I'm out walking, the electronic finder, and also the fact that Olympus solved the problem back in 2003 regarding dust accidentally reaching the sensor whenever you took the lens off the uh, camera. As well as taking landscapes, which is my forte, I also take historic buildings, stately homes, churches, castles, that kind of thing. But if working indoors, then sometimes tripods are not allowed. Well, with this system, I can hand hold the camera quite comfortably. And if I'm using one of the pro lenses that has an image stabilizer in the lens, then that works in conjunction with the stabilizer in the camera body. And I have in the past handheld a camera like this with that combination up to a shutter speed of a whole second. And believe you me, it is absolutely sharp. When I'm uh, working with uh, beginners, I, I like to surprise them by stating that so far we haven't produced a camera as good as you. And I should imagine that Olympus won't be very happy about me saying that. But let's turn the clock back a little bit. In the days of DSLR cameras, either film or digital, we had an optical viewfinder to compose our images. Now, although we were quite happy with that system, an optical finder was no, no better than the human eye. Now, of course, in recent trends in camera design, enter the electronic finder. What's the difference? Well, now it's reading the information of the camera's computer. So whatever changes you make, say to exposure or white balance, you get a preview before you take the picture. And I would consider this, although not perfect, is something better than an optical finder. And of course, the Olympus OMD pen cameras, they all have electronic finders. I have never understood why the sensor inside a digital camera should be the same size or format as a 35mm film camera, what we now call full frame. When the light reaches the lens, you know, it hasn't entered the lens yet, because from that point everything is different. The design of digital lenses are different to those of film lenses. And of course behind the lens is not film, but uh, a digital sensor. So surely we can look at a different format, and that's where micro four thirds come in. Now I'm not a technical person but I am told that there are in fact many advantages to this. I've mentioned one already about dust reaching the sensor. I'm told that is easier to accomplish, to put into the camera with micro four thirds and the same applies to image stabilization. But you know, at the time, and I'm now going back to 2003, nobody took much notice at the time, but gradually views are changing, I notice. Whatever the technical specification of the camera, micro four thirds, full frame, whatever, more important is the person standing behind the camera 
taking, of course, the picture. When I ran photographic holidays, sometimes I would meet beginners, novices. They've just purchased a high-end camera and they hadn't even taken it out of the box, let alone put the batteries in the camera, by the way. But they expected, because of the high technical specification of the camera, they expected to be expert with that camera sometimes in the weekend that I was teaching photography. Camera manufacturers fall over themselves to help you with your photography, with technical innovations. Some good, others perhaps a little questionable. But I do landscape photography and the skill in doing that goes way beyond the technical excellence of this or any camera. I have to work with light and weather and I have to have knowledge in these matters before I can take a single decent landscape photograph and I'll show you that in a moment. Although I classify myself as a landscape photographer and the occasional building as well of course, uh, I'm a UK. I keep to the United Kingdom for my pictures. I don't go abroad. Yes, I've been to France on holiday, but France is a much bigger country than the UK. So as a solo worker, working professionally, then I'm casting the net too wide. So I'm sorry to disappoint you if I'm sticking to this country, but so I can offer my clients a service in depth. My knowledge of landscape photography actually goes no further than the White Cliffs of Dover. Let's look at a few pictures in detail. I will show the metadata, but that is not the only or complete answer. The quality of light makes or breaks a landscape. So let's start at the beginning with a sunrise. I often stay at HF Holiday's Hotel at Derwent Bank. It's not far from Keswick. It has its own shoreline bordering Derwent Water and it faces east. So the location is perfect, especially when my bedroom faces the lake. I have got away with this shot. When including the sun, a zoom lens is not the best optic. A prime would have been better. Also, I have stopped down risking diffraction. Naughty. But the alternative with a larger aperture is flare. And that is worse. I got rid of a bit in post-production, but I'm not telling you where it was. More important is timing. This is August, so I had to rise early. In winter, I could have my breakfast first. I was lucky with the mist, which only forms below a certain temperature, and there wasn't a breath of wind. So we see that timing and weather is far more important than the metadata. Scout Scar. Now, this is a location familiar to Kendall folk, but motorists on the bypass will probably be unaware of its existence. It makes a pleasant change to the honey pots of the Lake District, like Windermere and Derwent Water, and the views west are just as spectacular, stretching from Morecambe Bay to the far eastern fells. I took a party there at four o'clock, following a workout at Rydal Water, and I couldn't drag them away until after sunset. It was just so spectacular. There is more to landscape photography than the lakes, or indeed the dales, or Snowdonia. 
is a landscape outside a national park really not so good? In my defence, I offer my own area, Surrey, which boasts more trees per square mile than any other county. On St Martha's Hill, not far from Guildford, and late in the day, I was caught in a heavy shower. It wasn't planned, of course, but I carried on, and the EM1, courtesy of its weather seals, survived to perform another day, even if I didn't. Here, for comparison, is a similar view taken on a nice sunny day. A favourite photo location is Dunstanborough Castle, Northumberland, best approached from Craster, a walk of about what a mile over easy grassy terrain. It's a joy. Being on the east coast and therefore regarded normally as a sunrise shot, it is just as a resting at sunset. Because the land west of the castle is relatively flat, and the castle itself is on raised ground, there is nothing to stop the sun's rays from adding their own touch of magic, a landscape for lingering. Instead of joining the queues for Glencoe, there are plenty of other attractive landscapes around Scotland to attract the eye and camera. Further west, across Loch Linney and beyond Strontian, are the wild expanses of Moidart. It is well off the beaten track and borders the Atlantic, getting all the weather that the ocean can toss at it. Consequently, the lighting can vary enormously, which of course is the undeniable attraction of this photo visit, especially around Castle Turam, situated on its own tidal island. So be careful, you might stay a little longer than planned, and I nearly got caught last time. For churches, a shot without people might be preferred, and rows of chairs, as at Ely, doesn't really help the composition either. At Lincoln, I was lucky, but there is always one, isn't there? You may find the websites of cathedrals helpful when searching for information about chairs. Some remove them for a period, usually for a month. Balancing extremes of exposure between bright windows and a dark interior are always a problem. Recent cameras coupled with up-to-date software can usually balance these extremes, which is my preference. There is, of course, HDR, and the OMD system does allow you to execute this technique hand-holding the camera. At Hereford, I was able to take the nave ceiling at a fifth of a second, yes, a fifth of a second, handheld, aided by the 12 to 100 Pro lens, which has its own image stabilizer, and that works with the camera's stabilizer. I am told that effective image stabilization is easier to accomplish with micro four thirds than larger formats. I don't know whether this is true, but it seems to work. Tripods are not allowed at King's College Chapel, Cambridge. Time for a bit of traditional technique using a Suico F 1.2 prime lens with a digital focal length of 25 millimeters. At full aperture, I had to be careful about depth of field when I wanted the whole picture to be sharp. It was too easy to end up with differential focusing when I didn't want it. I held my breath, incidentally, for sharp images not spot by a camera shape. And that's an old technique I learnt 60 years ago and still applies today. One of the most striking shots I ever achieved 
with the image stabilizers in the EM1 Mark II and the 12 to 100 Pro lens was my accident at Lulworth Cove. I was with a group planning astrophotography, but someone had forgotten about the full moon. Nothing daunted, I pointed the camera at it, and without thinking or even setting the camera up, I just pressed the shutter button. Thankfully, I didn't move the camera, and when I checked the metadata, to my surprise, the exposure time was a full eight seconds. I tried to repeat it, but couldn't. There is a moral to this story somewhere there. My photography is inspired by the subject, with, of course, Olympus technology not very far behind. Micro Four Thirds is absolutely ideal for my type of work. Why? Well, very often I am walking, say, a dozen miles over mountain and moorland, and might I say, as a person well into his 70s, I am quite capable of doing that. However, I keep my gear down to a minimum. My favourite workhorse lens is the 12 to 100. And I can keep my kit down to the minimum because I do my research first before going to a place. I have a pretty good idea what to expect. And in fact, if you were by chance happen to see me, then you wouldn't be aware that I was a photographer. I like to keep myself incognito and private. I must confess that I am very much a lone worker. As I am walking the countryside, wherever I am, having been in the record, the music industry, then music is in my head the whole time. Uh, I don't use um, personal headphones. I'm of the opinion that they will make you prematurely deaf. But I'm very much into music, some of which find my way into productions where copyright rules allow me to do that. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is my Olympus vision. As I say, although I rely and appreciate, and I think it's a wonderful technology, then I cannot do my work, well, knowledge of subject, what I'm photographing, the landscape beneath my feet, these wonderful houses, churches, cathedrals and castles, and so on. But having said all of that, I'm quite happy to pass on technical and perhaps other information to you, my audience. And I hope you enjoy these uh, productions. If you do and you're not a subscriber, then please feel free to become a subscriber. You should learn about my latest productions. It doesn't cost you anything. Alternatively, you can become a member and support my work financially. And for that, you get a preview long before anybody else, of my latest production, including this one. Thank you for watching.